As I mentioned in the first part of this series, a symbol overview, um, <clears throat> I'm going to be asking you throughout this whole series to be perceiving the essential meaning of the various images that I present. And I've done that a few times so far. <clears throat> but here is where it becomes really important that you use that faculty um, with the symbols that I'm going to be presenting. And if possible for you, uh, with the words that I'm going to be speaking. You know, try to see the essential meaning in what I'm saying and the ideas that I'm presenting, the structure of those ideas. Okay? So, get your <clears throat> perceiving essential meaning caps on and uh, I'll proceed. So, <clears throat> I've introduced you to the symbol in general and the, the five parts of the symbol. Now my plan is to take you through all 46 parts of the Tree of Life symbol in what I consider the creative sequence. <clears throat> it's the sequence in which the paths are emanated <clears throat> from, the, from Kether to Malkuth. <clears throat> now this doesn't happen sequentially, of course, but this is a good way of coming to an understanding of the Tree of Life if we follow the sequence of emanation. Now it's not really creative either. There's no creating going on here. It just is. All at once. It all is at once. But in order to understand it with our sequentialized minds in this sequentialized experience that we have of existence, we, we need to approach it in this way of sequence. So, get your... <clears throat> Perceiving essential meaning caps on, because this is the symbol that we are going to be exploring from the top to the bottom. We're going to start at the beginning with Kether. This presents a, a, a very different essential meaning than this symbol. But, everything in this symbol is included in Kether. Kether, crown, contains everything within the symbol. It contains the whole tree. That's all packed into Kether. Into this simple symbol. <clears throat> this symbol and this symbol are exactly the same thing. Just stated differently. Okay? <clears throat> now the Sephirot, as I said before, uh, are descriptions of really arbitrarily defined, uh, human arbitrarily defined static states of the awareness of the I. It's all the awareness of the I. <clears throat> From Kether to Malkuth, the whole shebang is the awareness of the I. But as you can see, the I is anything but a static state. But, again, for our sequentialized awareness is the only way you're going to grab hold of these concepts and experience this tree is if we go in sequence of these static states. Now, the connecting paths 
are by definition not static states. But the Sephirot, which you know is where we're beginning our discussion here, the first of those 46 components, we're going to have to define it as a static state. You're going to have to excuse me because it's impossible for me to describe Kether purely as a static state because it contains all these perspectives within it, ultimately. <clears throat> but what I need to convey to you is that static state that we mean by Kether, by crown. Now the crown is an interesting imagery here. It stands above normal human awareness. It's a separate kind of thing, but it rests on human awareness. A crown doesn't mean anything. It's just a pretty piece of jewelry if it's not sitting on a head. Okay. If it's not making the queen or the king, it's of no value other than as a fancy piece of jewelry. <clears throat> so crown, this is, it confers all the power to the monarch, okay? This is where the monarch's power comes from is from the crown. Okay. That is the crowning ritual. It's connecting the individual with the power in that crown. That's the magic of a coronation. You know, the supposed original magic of coronation was connecting the individual, the monarch, with that higher power. Okay. Now that higher power is, <clears throat> is nothing other than everything. The awareness uh, of everything, the awareness possessed by everything, the awareness within everything, the awareness that composes Everything, everything is mental, as the Kabbalion says. But that's true. You know, regardless of the, the source of that saying, it's true. Everything is mental. Everything is awareness. Everything is consciousness. And that's what Kether is. It's everything that exists. Everything that has being. All being. That is the crown. That is Kether. That is the I. The I. The all-inclusive, infinitely inclusive I, everything that exists, is here in this I, okay? Kether is an undifferentiated state of I-ness. It is one I that contains all of this. One I, the I, the unity of all awareness. Now, <clears throat> as human beings with a human consciousness uh, approaching the ultimate I, we experience it as our own I-ness. 
it's the same I-ness as the I. That same sense of I that we all have <clears throat> within us. That everything that exists has within us that I. All of these little experiences of I are the I. All of them together are the I. That is Kether. That is the crown in terms of the static state of awareness that we're referring to with the, the term kether or crown. Okay. <clears throat> so, the experience of that I-ness, that I of kether, is inherent to everything. Every one of us human beings included. You know, we all have easy access to the eye because it's the most common thing. It's kether. Everything is inside of kether. Everything is contained within kether. So everything experiences kether. It's the most common experience, the most, it's the one experience that every single human being has. And it's exactly the same for every human being. I. I. It's so simple, so fundamental to existence. And not only do human beings experience that I, but everything around us, every material thing in the infinite universe experiences that same I and all of us together form the I of Kether. <clears throat> so, that I is right inside of us, always. It's everywhere around us, always. <laughs> That's why we're starting here in Kether, because it's the most common thing. <clears throat> It's not some separate God that we have to pray to, that we need a priest to reach, that we need magic rituals and years of study and work to make contact with. That's bullshit programming. <laughs> That's just a way to control you. That thought has been pounded into you since your first breath, and it's a way to control you. Okay? And it's the most fundamental way of controlling people. Control their access to God. You know, uh, define it as God to begin with, and then control access to it. That's the greatest crime against humanity because <clears throat> we all have continuous access to it all the time. It's no big deal. <clears throat> when we... <clears throat> well... <clears throat> As modern human beings, we have all of that programming of the inaccessibility 
of the eye of the unity to our awareness, we have all that programming to fight against, to reverse, to dissemble, you know, to break down, uh, to root out of our thinking and dispose of it in order to reach the fullness of our possible experience of Kether, of the I. So we can reach up to Kether through that I, in that internal I-ness, but this is just the first touching of it. And it's just a minor bit of the eventual experience we can have of I. Hmm. That's so much more than that, than what we experience through our own I-ness, okay? So, <clears throat> this descent from Kether into the fullness of the tree is going to teach us how to break that apart. That's what this glyph does for us modern, <clears throat> modern humans is it shows us how to <clears throat> fully <clears throat> experience the unity of all awareness. So, <clears throat> Cather, that static state of awareness, which isn't static at all, um, <clears throat> In, on one hand, it experiences itself as this undiv undifferentiated, mass, massive awareness. It just is. It just exists. Okay? But it also is self-realizing. See, that's inherent in the nature of awareness, that it must, it does <laughs> self-realize, it self-realizes. That's what it means to be aware, is awareness of self. So the I is on one hand undifferentiated awareness, just a completely homogenous awareness, that is infinite, you know, it's all that exists. <clears throat> but it also realizes that it has a certain character, you know, certain characteristics. It has meaning to itself. I mean, it has itself. It looks like this, you know. Itself is this. So it begins to self-realize. And this is sort of the other phase of, of Kether, the self-realizing phase. And we call this Chokmah, or rather, <clears throat> to get things spatially right with the diagrams behind me and internally, we call this Chokmah, a central meaning. This is another face of Kether, essentially that part of Kether, that unified awareness, realizing itself, <coughs> excuse me, realizing itself, that it exists, and realizing that it, its existence has a certain shape, a certain form. There is form to its existence, structure, sequence. And this is Bina, the unified awareness that realizes it must take form, it must manifest, which then gives birth to the Sikantu realm, which is yet again another face of Kether. But we're talking more about that static state of Kether. So there's the infinitely homogenous 
unified, undifferentiated state. There's also that, that looking within itself state, recognizing itself state of kether, that static kether. And then there is the state that looks beyond itself. And this is where the ancients well, were presented with a problem. The problem of language, the problem of sequentialized language, the language of being, okay? So, Kether is all being. Everything that exists is Kether, okay? So anything outside of Kether is not something that exists. It has no existence, no being, because all of that's in Kether, okay? So it's impossible for us as sequentialized consciousnesses to even conceive of what that is, okay? Likewise, Kether, Ketheric awareness, has no frame of reference to define what is beyond it, other than that it recognizes a difference. Beyond it, it recognizes that it is an enclosed infinity, okay? It is infinite within itself, but there is, I can't use the word other because other implies being, and that's all inside Kether. You see what I'm saying? So we can't define it. The ancients, ancient Kabbalists called it the Ein Sof Aur, the limitless light. <clears throat> it's as good as any kind of description because they're all completely useless. There's no point in even trying, okay? Experiencing uh, the, the Ein Sof uh, as Kether is a very interesting experience. Uh, that doesn't translate at all to the human intellect, other than that it is an interesting, odd experience. Okay. To truly rise as a human consciousness to Kether, a lot of people have this misconception that at some point you lose yourself. Okay, and this just there's no way you can, you know, uh, keep a memory of that experience because you completely disconnect from your individualized awareness. That is simply not true, okay? Um, as long as you are incarnate, you're connected to your physical body. Your consciousness is like a, a really, really long, infinitely long rope, okay? It's a cord, and it's all connected to wherever you're rooted, wherever your incarnation is. So my consciousness always comes right back down here because this is where I'm incarnated. But I can still reach up to Cather. Now it's my awareness that is merging with the Catholic awareness. And that is entirely possible. Because there is still this minor, thin little thread of connection in my awareness that is always rooted 
right here in my Malkuth. Likewise, that Catholic awareness, that infinite I, can descend in its whole into my Malkuth, following that same thread. It's that thread of awareness through which Kether is continuously experiencing our existence. Our existence is part of Kether. You know, everything we're thinking and feeling and doing, that's part of the experience of Kether. So that connection exists for the entire incarnation. It retracts a little between incarnations back to my solitary self of the individual self, that little reflection of the I that is me. And then it descends again during incarnation to, you know, the Malkuth, the temporal present moment that Kether connects to, okay? Like I said, this image is the same as this image. <clears throat> so, to be in Kether with my little awareness, that little thing, Thread of me experiencing this. <clears throat> for me, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> for human beings, the experience of Kether is, is one of light, but it's not exactly light, because when we think of light, light comes in all kinds of varieties, different colors, Loosely, when we usually when we say light, we mean a white light, a visible white light. But that's not the light we mean. Kether is brilliance. That's the only human concept that begins to touch on the light of Kether. I call it Ketheric brilliance for that very reason. It's the best descriptor. <clears throat> So it is an experience of just pure brilliance, nothing other than pure brilliance that is infinitely wide, you know, infinitely in every direction, just infinite, and it just is. It doesn't have any beginning or ending or middle or now or then or anything like that. It just is simply is. When you begin to follow that the awareness into the self-realization of Hokma and Bina and Tiferet and etc., <clears throat> then it becomes more complex and more active, okay? The real dynamism of the whole tree emerges, manifests. But what we refer to as Kether is again that static, undifferentiated brilliance that is all awareness, all awareness. Now that awareness certain needs, certain urges, certain natural uh, aspects uh, that it must manifest. It must realize itself. It must perceive itself. It must perceive. And the only thing it can perceive is itself. 
there's nothing else other than itself to perceive. So it perceives that it, it, it means something. It has a significance, a meaning, an importance. And this is chokmah. This is the essential meaning of the I. What it means. And it means an infinite number of things at every step. The I is infinite. So it means an infinite number of things. But in Chokmah, all those meanings are undifferentiated and it is an essential meaning in Chokmah. Okay, it is just an essential meaning. And we call this wisdom because a human experience of essential meaning is not something that we figure out. It's something that we know. It's just all there automatically and we know. It's like when we're perceiving the essential meaning of anything, that information is just all, just immediately there. And we just know it. We perceive it. And we know it. That's wisdom. Chokmah. <clears throat> Where all the meaning of the I is in one place all together and it is so powerful. It is so full of this essential meaning and that Catholic brilliance. Hokma is filled with the Catholic brilliance and it manifests in Hokma as essential meaning. Essential meaning is an ob objective thing. Okay? It's not meaning that is derived. It's not a subjective meaning. It's not my meaning versus your meaning. It's the objective meaning. It is well, objective meaning, essential meaning. It is at the root of the I. You know, it's essential meaning makes up the entire body of the I. The entire manifestation of the I is through this essential meaning in Hokma. So this is really the first stage of manifestation. But as a static, static state, it is the undifferentiated essential meaning of I-ness, of I, of that infinite expanse, infinite collective of awareness. <sighs> Kether is the unity, okay? Hokma is the unity of parts, because here in Hokma, from Hokma, one can look down and see all of those infinite number of parts manifest through the temporal realm. It's all essential meaning manifesting itself. All the different shades and types and flavors of meaning. That's below Hokma and visible from Hokma. Okay. So, standing in Hokma, that's oh, one knows everything to be known in Hokma, because it's all right there, and <clears throat> essential meaning must express itself. That's one thing that's felt in Hakma is this 
intense pressure to express this essential meaning, okay? But before we go beyond Hokma, we must now first deal with the first path, the very first connection between Kether and Hokma. And this is the path of He, the Hebrew letter He, which stands for uh, window. And this is actually uh, a picture, if you will, uh, a hieroglyph of a window. And it stands for the zodiacal sign of Aries which is ruled by Mars. And the fire element, it's the fire sign, the fire sign, really. So all the symbolism for this path, this transition from Kether to Hakma, from the unity of all awareness to the self-realization of the meaning of the I. It's this transition of consciousness that is being described here. And it is fiery. It is the most creative of paths. It's instantaneous, you know. It has that Aries energy of, oh, I've decided, I've done it now. You know, it's just this immediate, full force, you know, giving everything to the adventure, to the realization, oh my God, look at what I found. You know, it's just, the, the, the awareness of the eye is just so creative in this moment because in effect it's creating itself by you know realizing itself this is how it creates it realizes the existence of what is okay this is the path of Aries now <clears throat> This is the transmission of that Catholic brilliance into Hakma, which manifests in Hakma as essential meaning. So essential meaning is born out of that Catholic brilliance. Now Catholic brilliance is nothing other than the eye awareness. The eye awareness as it moves throughout the body of the tree of itself does so as Catholic brilliance. It's perceivable as Catholic brilliance. And it's just something that we can work with and manipulate. Like an element or a fluid, okay? It's the awareness of the eye. It is the most common substance. Everything, ultimately, is composed of the Catholic brilliance that has manifest in all these other forms, okay? But at its heart, everything is Catholic, everything is Catholic brilliance. So, the path of He, it transmits awareness. It's this shifting of awareness from completely undifferentiated, everything just is, and I'm not questioning anything, to, oh, I'm realizing that I mean all these things. And it's a heavy weight that I mean. You know, it's, it's really something substantial that I mean. Okay. The path of 
path of hay. Um, making that shift, that uh, shift in awareness confers great creativity for the human awareness that takes that journey, okay? It establishes a connection to uh, the spirit of creativity, to the abandon, the abandonment. Um, well, one must abandon oneself to the creative force. That is what one gets in touch with through the path of hay. Now, I <clears throat> described the path of He after describing the, the static state of Hulkman. <clears throat> but, <laughs> really, like I said before, there is not a sequence to it. So it's really impossible to uh, distinguish that... that um, movement uh, of the awareness described by the path of hay from the you know uh, uh, creation if you will of hokma you know <laughs> because it happens simultaneously you, you can't have hokma without Kether making that shift of awareness okay so they come hand in hand and it's true of each of the Sephirotic states I'm going to be, you know, hitting in sequence here. So Bina is the next one. But <clears throat> I really can't describe uh, Bina without also describing the shift in awareness, you know, which is, of course, the path of Shin and the path of Av. You know, both of these paths describe that shift of awareness that is then described as the static state of Bina. So, I'll just describe how Bina comes and then go back and describe the sh specific shifts, the two paths that lead to Bina. So, <clears throat> we're in Hokma. There is, like I said, this powerful, dynamic force of a central meaning here in Hokma. I mean, it's infinite in its potency, in its significance, you know, its meaning, and it must be expressed. That's the f a fundamental to the nature of a central meaning. It must express itself. It's an outward flow. Meaning expresses itself. It makes itself known. And then we have Bina, which is the expression of essential meaning through form. That is the fundamental expression of essential meaning is form. This is why my directions for the direct perception of essential meaning is to look at the form. The form speaks immediately to you. It gives you an immediate uh, expression of its own essential meaning. Okay? It's the conduit through which essential meaning is expressed in the temporal realm. Okay. But here in the supernal realm, it's undifferentiated form, uh, or rather it's a differentiated form that is changing infinitely. It's no form has any permanence at all. It's infinitely brief in its manifestation and Bina is just a complete jumble of forms as all of those essential 
meanings in Hokma become are expressed through form. So it's oh it's infinitely changeable. And it is infinite. Infinite forms. Just infinite forms constantly changing. Just but there is Oh boy, how to say this is so difficult to capture with words. So you're going to have to you know, try to perceive the essential meaning of what I'm trying to say here. So in Bina, the uh, Catholic awareness that, that the I is starting to realize that it has all of these parts. All of these parts are beginning to become visible to it, beginning to distinguish themselves as uh, not potentials but inevitabilities. It is inevitable uh, at this point that there is more to uh, this self-realization, this manifest, this self-realization must then become manifestation. Okay, it must go beyond just this infinite jumble of infinitely brief um, per perceived forms, okay? So in the midst of all this sort of, it's sort of a feeling of fragmentation in a way. Not really, but it's, it's like sort of fragmenting and the thing about awareness is it wants to be a collective whole. That is, its fundamental state is unified, okay? So throughout its manifestation, that fundamental state is sort of always longed for, always striven for. Consciousness is always trying to come together, and it's doing that in Bina. And Bina sort of has these little clumps of awareness. So the specific essential meaning, for example, human beings, human beings on the whole have a certain set of essential meanings that make them human beings, okay? That when it comes to manifestation, this essential meaning has to manifest in a humanoid body. It's just the only kind of form that will work for it. So, there, all the... <clears throat> that specific grouping of essential meanings is starting to come together and forming what I call a greater self. And in Bina, because it's sort of layers to Bina. It's not one solid uh, static state. It's the hardest of them all, I think, to describe as a truly static state. Because it's more a, a region. Um, <clears throat> so at the lower reaches of that region, still in the supernal non-sequential realm, but not in the sequential realm of time-space, okay, before it starts to make that transition, the greater selves become more concentrated. So, it's not at that stage the, the greater selves of all of humanity, it's very specific greater selves of groups of individuals. There are perhaps an infinite number of human greater selves, okay? But each of those human greater selves gives birth to any number of human individual selves. Those little reflections of the eye are born out of those 
greater selves, okay? It is the greater selves that give birth ultimately to the temporal realm, to everything that exists. <clears throat> so, back in Vina, this coalescing of awareness is starting to happen, starting to get sort of globular, <laughs> as it were. <clears throat> And in Bina, this is uh, the easiest, uh, the, the easiest part of the supernal realm to have a um, to have a really uh, significant, um, thorough <laughs> experience of the supernal realm happens first, really, here in Bina with your own greater self. That's like the bridge to the supernal realm. It's the doorway into the supernal realm for each individual is through their greater self because that's that little cord of awareness that leads up to the eye, passes through all those greater selves, okay? and through your individual self's greater self. <clears throat> that is our connection, most immediate connection, to the supernal realm. And the connection, uh, the connection that we call our conscience. Now in English, that has a very specific meaning, different than consciousness. So if you're not an English speaker, you might want to look up the difference in definition between conscience and consciousness. <clears throat> so, it's your conscience. It's the little voice inside that tells you what's right and what's wrong. Okay? That's the simplest definition of the conscience. Um, <clears throat> that is your connection to your greater self. Greater self, getting my diagrams wrong behind me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, so, in Bina, we can meet, as it were, our greater self and have a sort of person-to-person -person discourse with our greater self. That's all very feasible and fairly common, okay? Um, and that is, it is, number one, our own awareness. We're not going to a foreign realm here. This is within our own awareness. It's just going where we don't usually go. Do the root there is through the fire region of our mental body, the most ephemeral part of our mental body, takes us to the supernal realm and our greater self. Okay, uh, and from the perspective of greater self, we can see. We can see so many things. We can see the entire temporal realm spread out below us. All of time and space is below us and can be viewed. It's not necessarily as simple as that, but it's basic gist of it. Um, we gain certain wisdom regarding our own life, our own... We see the source of our own individuality in its purest form from Bina, because it stands above our individual self. 
So we get an overview, as it were, of our own individual self. And we can also see the other individual uh, selves projected by our own greater self. We can see our relatives, as it were. Um, <clears throat> oh, there's so much to be learned from that perspective, that perspective outside of time and space. Uh, it'll give you a, a, a totally different uh, perspective on your own little ego and uh, any sense of egotism that you might have uh, remaining at this point. Uh, will be put in its place. Let's put it that way. So, uh, Bina <clears throat> is full <laughs> of form and it is internally, gravitationally being pulled down into manifestation sequentialized manifestation, the pull of sequence is very strong in Bina, okay? <clears throat> now to <clears throat> to get to Bina, we have two paths. One is from Kether and it's the path of Va. Vav is a nail, a spike. Nail is the actual meaning, but it's something that affixes something to something else, okay? Um, it's the sign of Taurus, which is an earth sign ruled by Venus. Now, this is really a very beautiful uh, path, a, a beautiful transition, because what I was saying before about Kether, it's infinite, undifferentiated awareness, it just is. It's perfect, it's beautiful, and it just is the way it is. And that's what comes down through the path of Taurus into Bina, that perfection, that beauty of form, the complete rightness of all those forms in Bina, each form for each essential meaning is perfect for that essential meaning. And it's beautiful. Each form for each essential meaning is perfect and beautiful. And that comes from Kether down the path of all. Because that's the, the absolute rightness. And that's what Taurus is about. Taurus is the cow, the bull. You know, the bull just stands out there in its field and grazes and moves around from one bunch of grass to another bunch of grass and just lives its life, enjoys the sun and the rain and the grass, and it's just all perfect, you know? It's just a totally groovy life. Well, I mean, that's essentially what Taurus is, is that Venusian uh, beauty in existence, in form. The perfect form. And that is what is gained when you travel this path Oh, you, you understand 
the, the perfection of each form, you see why, you know, the, the rationale behind the perfection of each form. And in combination with the path of Aries and the creativity that you can connect with, that understanding of form it, it, it ties in perfectly and you end up with perfect forms, you know, in your creative work. It, it amplifies the perfection of your creative work. Okay. So the other path that creates Bina and, and really the, the main path that, that forms Bina is the path of Shin that comes from Hukma. And whoa, Shin is the fire. Now it's the supernal fire. It's not the fire that burns your hand kind of fires. It's the power of awareness. It's uh, going wrong directions here. <clears throat> it's the power of awareness coming from Hokna, Hokma into Bina. It is that massive energy of the <clears throat> essential meaning that must express itself. And it's that must express itself that is the fire of Shin. And it comes to Bina and explodes into an infinitude of forms. So this is the Catholic brilliance and the essential meaning rushing across, expressing itself. That is the power of the need for essential meaning to express itself. It's the power of essential meaning, its need to express itself, which powers the <clears throat> creation of the temporal realm, the sequential realm. It's that force coming through Shin that forces uh, all those forms to manifest. That is the power of manifestation, it is that desire of a central meaning to express itself to its fullest. Okay? Wow, when you touch upon that path and travel that, that shift in awareness, it teaches you so much about the power of essential meaning and its need to express and what we can do with that need. We can hook ourselves onto that, uh, that force and go for a ride. Um, we can hitchhike that powerful need that essential meaning has to express itself. Okay? Do, do you see what I'm saying there? Um, we can make use of the power of essential meaning of its need to express itself. That <clears throat> is a very powerful magic. <clears throat> we also learn <clears throat> about the powerful force and capabilities of awareness. Awareness is no slouch, you know, it's, it's powerful shit. It's the most powerful force is that of awareness. It is the source 
of all the other forces that exist. Awareness, okay? <clears throat> so, we've got all this coming into Bina from Kokma and from Kether. And we have Bina. Now, uh, we have Bina. <laughs> Uh, I have to uh, uh, apologize here. Um, internally, it's as you see behind you in these diagrams, that's what it is internally for me. But I am so used to referring to a diagram that is on the wall opposite the camera here, behind the camera, and it's the opposite, you know, so I'm, you know pointing to the diagram and making these movements, but these movements inside of me are different. <clears throat> they are what you're seeing behind you, as if I have stepped into that image. I am that image talking to you, okay? <clears throat> so, there's all this stuff happening. Hakma, I mean Kether, the eye, has realized that it means something. And that meaning has to express itself through form. And there is just this bursting bubble of infinite form here in Bina that has to explode. It must give birth. It must all of that essential meaning with all of its forms must manifest and that is how it will express itself it must express itself through individualized forms by solitary selves and that will be in our next video. Whew. Okay. Now, look again for the essential meaning in this sequence of form, this sequence of images. We start with the whole, and as we know, that's the same image here, but it starts to flesh itself out a little bit. Oh, obviously, we're just at the beginning. We're all ready for something else. Something more. Okay. So I'll leave you there until next time. Bye-bye.